friends welcome to this lecture on science technology and politics today's lecture title is technological revolution why your university degrees bring no solution to grave problems of the world so friends i am going to make an argument before you that scientific knowledge which we gain from universities and the practical needs of the society do not have any kind of connections that will be the core argument i would be proposing in this lecture that's why the title why university degrees bring no solution to grave problems of the world that is argument is that technology has grown independently of science science did not contribute much to the development of uh, technology and science was abstract that it was an attempt to understand nature the secrets of nature but technology was different technology didn't grow out of science rather technology grown out of the needs of man so that means technology is socially shaped not shaped by science that is the core argument that you have to keep in mind so friends man's attempt to understand natural world had been shaped by the great minds we know from copernicus a newton to einstein in physics and from Darwin to grigor mendel in life sciences the contributions of great men were tremendous but our scientific knowledge has a very serious problem friends our world is full of people with higher qualifications for a world that doesn't exist at all that means we have so many qualified people from our university systems but they don't have jobs and in society there are so many jobs for which there are no qualified people that being stated friends there is a huge mismatch a huge gulf between university knowledge and the needs of the society so friends it is in this gap that is the needs of the society and higher education knowledge knowledge from the higher education there is a big gap and friends all the technology that we have are not created by scientific knowledge but the technology we have are shaped by social necessities so i can tell you the best example friends you know you remember elon musk a technocrat he had received bachelor's degree in economics and physics which you, you which you may know 
but his plans and his area of work has nothing to do with the degrees he had he was part of the paypal a ceo of spacex and chief product architect of tesla motors he got crazy ideas for futuristic technologies but none of these technologies are derived from his university knowledge richard branson who recently went to space with his own virgin galactic and he claimed that he didn't even finish secondary school steve jobs of apple company was a dropout bill gates of microsoft corporation is a dropout paul allen the microsoft co-founder is a dropout john kaum the whatsapp co-founder is a dropout travis kalanick the uber co-founder and its former ceo was a dropout university dropout jack dorsey the founder of twitter is a dropout ivan williams another founder of twitter is a dot uh, is a dropout so friends what we have to find out from these success stories greatest change makers of our time are not greatest scientists of our time they are technocrats of our time not the inventors they are technocrats not the inventors so invention is different techno technocracy is different technocracy is practice a pra uh, practice or they are practitioners of technology inventors just invent the first question you need to ask friends why there is no connection between technological advancements and scientific knowledge produced in our university research labs or in higher education institutions to understand this we need to know how technological inventions were evolved without the support of scientific academic knowledge so friends most of the technological innovations that we enjoy today have developed without the support of scientific academic knowledge so modern scientific knowledge we know did not emerge full scale from scientific revolution from copernicus to isaac newton the technological words we have are in an achievement of the world view of uh, isaac newton or charles darwin or albert einstein and friends global industrial revolution did not arise overnight and we should keep in mind the idea that technological revolutions are not suddenly sparked by james watt and his steam engine friends theoretical science did not immediately find application in industry and practical life historians tell you that 
during the 17th century many attempts were made to smelt iron to smelt iron or to smelt iron ore using coal as fuel in 17th century attempts were made to smelt iron or using coal as a fuel but all of them proved unsuccessful the traditional method of smelting iron the fuel and the ore the fuel and the iron ore had to be physically mixed had to be physically mixed for them to react chemically iron ore and the fuel are mixed that is traditional method of smelting iron and in this uh, 11th century the chinese had an advanced knowledge in iron melting but europe didn't develop such a sophisticated knowledge of iron smelting it was in 1709 1709 that is uh, 16th century 1709 so it's not uh, 18th century 18th century in 1709 abraham darby abraham darby an iron master succeeded in using charred coal or cork c o k cork instead of charcoal in the blast furnace where iron is melt and friends to do this historians tell you that darby darby neither used scientific theory nor institutionalized the science he never used any scientific theory to do to make this invention and friends applicable theoretical metallurgy had not come into being those days and as a typical artisan engineer darby left no records of his experiment that how he used charcoal cord for smelting iron in charcoal am i audible friends am i audible no yes sir Friends, it was in 1784. The English inventor Henry Cort developed puddling process. Puddling process for converting cast iron to wrought iron. using coal that he converted cast iron or pig iron to wrought iron using coal that he shaped he shaped iron by using coal he used no theoretical science for doing this and we know with this invention the world ended into a new iron age coal mining friends traditional method of removing water from the mines used animal power at the pit head that water was pumped from mines using animal power by the end of 17th century it became clear that we need Uh, some other efficient source of power to lift water from mines and friends fire engine was developed 
it was in 1712 see look all these developments are socially created not it is uh, created by scientific laboratories these are uh, necessitated by social necessities be it you know uh, the iron smelting the use of uh, cork in the furnaces or uh, conversion of cast iron into wrought iron by henry cot and friends you see in 1712 an english iron monger thomas newcomen developed a practical steam engine we are not sure and historians did, didn't uh, tell you that newcomen used theoretical science for his invention and uh, you know around middle of the 18th century two english craftsmen two english craftsmen john smeaton and james watt john smeaton and james watt improved the new common engine and friends we are not sure whether john Smeet uh, smeaton and james watt used theoretical science for their invention and what engine the steam engine developed by james watt that was an improvement of new common engine that has been adopted in the industries and that was also used in industries other than coal mining so that revolutionized the world steam engine revolutionized the industrial world friends richard travatic richard travatic he was a british mechanical engineer who developed world's first steam railway locomotive in 1803 and friends for that travatic never used any theoretical science of uh, universities or research laboratories these were all practical necessities of social life in 1814 a british engineer george stephenson unveiled his first steam locomotive so he was said to be the father of railways george stephenson was said to be the father of railways and the first public railroad connection founded between liverpool and manchester in 1830 he didn't use any theoretical science for this discovery for this invention in 1733 john k invented flying shuttle and textile industry was mechanized spinning wheel was mechanized friends with this flying shuttle of john k industrial civilization in britain became full scale friends you see whether it's flying shuttle or a railway locomotive or a steam engine or james watt steam engine or use of charred coal in blast furnaces people invented technologies which did not use any theoretical science these technologies were socially shaped it's an interesting point that we have to notice that technologies are socially shaped technologies that we enjoy today are not developed by our research labs and universities universities have not touch with the world it is far and far away from realities human realities but technologies are shaped by human necessities social necessities and friends in the similar way in the united states of america an assembly line system was developed by henry ford and he copied 
a butchering technique from a pig farm and applied it in manufacturing, automobile manufacturing industry. He wasn't a theoretical scientist. He was an industrialist and a business businessman. And friends, with the assembly line of Henry Ford, factory system, the modern factory system can scale and attain maturity. First, this was not an invention of universities or theoretical knowledge. This was a product of practical necessity. This was a product of practical necessity. Friends, with the development of uh, Henry Ford's idea of assembly line, new problems emerged in Europe. So labor became a necessity for industrial industrial world and also capital became an essential component of industrialization capital there was a bank of england established in 1694 but the official state bank of britain did nothing to promote industrialization and friends hundreds of private banks emerged in britain in the 17th century and in the 18th century the english mainland had witnessed so many private banks which catered to the capital requirement of emerging industries textile coal mining railway watts engine so these private banks began to provide financial capital for starting industries with a, uh, and the, with a low interest rate with a low interest rate and you can see that along with this this were not you know friends this you know financial capitals you know that, that was not a product of university uh, based theories that was shaped by social necessities. New ideas emerged. Laces fair. Before laces fair, mercantilism dominated in European world. Mercantilism was a reigning idea in Europe that promoted government supported export policies. And government wanted to increase its gold possession. But a laser square idea was born in Europe, particularly in Britain, along with industrial civilization. And you know, Adam Smith's path breaking book. The Wealth of Nations, which was published in the year 1776. Adam Smith path-breaking book, The Wealth of Nations, published in 1776, which signaled the rise of a new ideology, free market capitalism. And along with the free market capitalism, by 18th century and the beginning of the 19th century, we can see new ideas against free market capitalism emerged. New ideas against free capital, uh, capital free, free market capitalism uh, proposed by Arthur Smith in his book, The Wealth of Nations also was born. And Das Capital, Marx has written a three volume book, Das Capital in 1867, a technical book, nobody can understand what is inside it. But that proposed very complicated theories about industrial civilization and uh, free market capitalism. But we are not unable to read it because they are all complex formulas. And friends, Marx was not a university professor. 
but his ideas are widely taught in university departments across the world so friends so we can see that university knowledge and practical necessities of social world were basically disconnected in the uh, in the 17th century in 18th century as well in the beginning of the 19th century and throughout human history there was this disconnection that which we have already discussed in the previous lectures and friends in 1831 michael faraday created electricity by magnetism and he was a self educated experimentalist at the royal institution in england he was self educated and friends two sciences emerged independently one was thermodynamics the other one theory of evolution along with michael faraday along with michael faraday uh, uh, discovery of so invention of electricity two other independent sciences emerged thermodynamics and theory of evolution and james clerk maxwell mathematicized mathematicized faraday faraday's qualitative notions of electromagnetic field michael faraday proposed a qualitative notion of electromagnetic field which was quantified by james clerk maxwell which is famously known as maxwell equations maxwell equations friends all these developments took place outside the formal theoretical academic university knowledge and we can see by 1820 and 1840s industrial civilization began to spread across europe and other part of the world it was all developments in britain and later belgium germany france and us became industrialized in the 1820s and 1840s so netherland scandinavia spain and italy also joined this movement towards industrial civilization by 1820s and 1840s and along with this colonialism and imperialism different parts of the world began to experience some sort of industrialization because uh, britain and other european countries began to colonize territories in other part of the world in asia south uh, latin america and uh, africa so europeans began to uh, make themselves felt in uh, on a world scale and their technology their industries were also exported and we know in 18 i think it was in 1853 uh, first railway locomotive was started in india am i correct from pune train to pune right something like that i forgot the exact date so india also witness railway locomotive in 1853 so friends by 19th century application of science in industry started application of science in industry started a communication revolution was born in a communication revolution was born in friends and this communication revolution was not a product of university knowledge that was shaped by social necessities charles wheatstone charles wheatstone invented first electric telegraph he had invented first electric telegraph in 1837 and they created wheatstone and others created a telegraph industry
and london and paris in 1954 for the first time london and paris became connected alexander graham bell invented telephone in 1876 friends no theoretical science was used only practical utility and first commercial exchange opened in 1878 thomas alva edison in new jersey usa and joseph swan in England independently created independently created incandescent light bulb and a light bulb industry emerged Heinrich Hertz Heinrich Hertz Heinrich Hertz demonstrated a reality of radio demonstrated reality of radio waves in 1887 and the Italian Marconi developed radio transmission for this Marconi received Nobel Prize for his wireless telegraphy technology you see societies the needs of the society began to uh, bring in so many technological advancements. And in medicine, anesthesia was developed in dentistry and surgery in 1840s by Joseph Lister. Louis Pasteur developed gem theory of disease. And pasteurization began to be popular. And pasteurization resulted in so many other industries. Silk industry, wine industry, dairy industry, vinegar industry, beer industry. Varieties of industries were born out of pasteurization. And friends, it was in 1859, a tremendous change happened in 1859. What was it? It was in that year, Charles Darwin published The Origin of Species. Friends, by the time Charles Darwin wrote Origin of Species, the world know nothing about genetics or biochemistry or inheritance and friends by the time Charles Darwin published the origin of species by the time Charles Darwin published the origin of species the world did not know that the world the earth the earth existed not more than few hundred thousands of years old And by the time Charles Darwin published his or the origin of species, most people believed that the earth was born few thousand years ago. And friends, during life, during the lifetime of Charles Darwin, most of his theories were unpopular and not accepted. Because established theories never believed that, you know, uh, humans evolved. Humans evolved. So it was something like a heresy. So no established theoretical knowledge, no established university knowledge accepted Charles Darwin's theory. So Charles Darwin developed his theories independently. Friends, after six years of the publication of uh, Charles Darwin's book, 1859, The Origin of Species, The Theory of Evolution of Human Species, Grigor Mental, an Austrian, an Austrian monk proposed a theory of heredity. 
He said that heredity is not a blending process. Rather, heredity maintains traits in discrete units. And later these discrete units were called genes. And genes pass from generation to generation and through genes heredity passed from generation to generation. This was his theory, Gregor Mantel. Friends, it was a revolutionary idea. Just like what Charles Darwin said. And friends, it was in 1903. We began to conquer sky. This all happened independently of any theoretical knowledge. It was in 1903, Wright brothers, Orville Wright and Wilbur Bright, they flew for the first time an airplane in the history of human societies. On December 17, at, Kelly Ho at Kitty Hawk, at Kitty Hawk, on the outer banks of North Carolina, they flew an airplane for 12 seconds. And after their flight, the Wright brothers famously said that their inventions would be used in warfare. Their inventions would be used in warfare. But friends, the later the world realized that Wright brothers were wrong brothers because their inventions were, were not only used in warf uh, warfare, but it was used for commercial uh, world, for uh, transport, um, for the transportation of people from places to place. So their invention pushed the world, cut the way in which they technology without any kind of scientific knowledge. So you know, by nineteenth century, by the beginning of twentieth century, and by the end of the nineteenth century and the early twentieth century. Technological revolution transformed our homes. Our kitchens were reconstituted. So many machines were invented for our kitchens. Washing machine, 1910. Dryers, refrigerators, freezers, dishwashers, and vacuum cleaners, 1901. Gas and electric ovens. Microwave ovens, toasters, 1909, and so many other inventions for our kitchen. So our kitchens were transformed. So technologies of radio, television, movies, recording of mu music, all of them conquered the world. So in 1964 book, Understanding Media, Understanding Media, in a 1964 book titled Understanding Media, the famous theorist Marshall McLuhan articulated a concept of global village. He was believing that television will unite the world and bring the world under an umbrella. Because according to him, television created, you are there feeling to audience. And television brought the whole world into our dining halls. Because in 1969, there was the coverage of moon landing to, that was broadcasted to our dining halls. Apollo 13 disaster was broadcasted to our dining hall. Coverage of Vietnam War broadcasted to our dining halls. And friends, in our dining halls, the world for just for a few seconds, at least for a few seconds, were united. That's why Marshall McLuhan said, technology is going to create a new world in which we all of us live in a global village. 
And friends, it was during this time. And another revolution took place, the Einsteinian revolution and the quantum physics, the theory of relativity. It was in 1897, British physicist J.J. Thomson demonstrated cathode rays. And Mary Curie coined the term radioactivity. And friends, with this fixity of atoms, just like our notion of fixity of species was broken down. We all believed, particularly Christians believed that uh, human species are a distinct unit created in the world by the hand of God. And that was uh, the dominant notion in natural theology that human beings was a distinct creation that has nothing to do with other creations in the world. But Darwinian theory proved it as wrong and he said that humans evolved from other creations in the world. Just like that, atoms, the, the, the notion, our notion of fixity of atoms, atoms were broken. And German physicist Max Planck suggested that light came in discrete energy. Light came in discrete energy. That was, uh, you know, quantum physics. Quantum physics was born by Max Planck's theory that light came in discrete energy. And it was the turn of Albert Einstein. And in 1905, he published a series of scientific papers, a series of scientific papers. And his ideas are so complicated to understand, but that can be summarized in few sentences, few words. That is, nothing in the world can move faster than the speed of light. Nothing in the world can move faster than the speed of light. That was the summary of his theory. And Einstein's interpretation of the cosmos was that there is no privileged frames of reference, no master clock. There is no master clock that uh, in the world, be it space or outer space or be it planet Earth, there is no master clock. Time here and time uh, uh, in other places are, uh, you know, governed by a master clock. No, none of such theories, uh, you know, was validated by Einstein. That's, that was all disproved by Einstein's theory of relativity. And Einstein proposed a special relativity in 1905 and a general relativity in 1915. And Einstein in physics was born. And friends, Einstein in physics replaced four dimensional continuum. Sorry, uh, Einstein in uh, physics replaced the three dimensional Euclidean uh, space notions. Three dimensional notion of space was replaced by Einsteinian notion of four dimensional continuum of uh, space time. These are all complicated uh, physics theories. And in 1911, friends, Rutherford, Ernest, uh, Ernest Rutherford announced atoms were composed of empty space. And the physicist Neil Bohr along with Rutherford proposed a model for atoms. And they said that electrons orbiting a solid nucleus much like planets orbit the sun. So they proposed a model for the atoms. And you know other discoveries proved that since the 18th century that many galaxies may populate the cosmos beyond our Milky Way. So we are all part of the Milky Way. Our galaxy is part of the Milky Way. And many, many galaxies exist beyond our Milky Way. That was even proved in the 19th century. And friends, it was in 1953, 
a revolutionary idea took place. It was a tale of uh, James Watson and Francis Crick. They decoded the molecular structure of DNA. It was a landmark dis discovery for which they received Nobel Prize in 1962. And friends, with this, The world has been moving towards a situation in which science and technology were blended by the end of 20th century. We are going to see that science and technology were blended. Before that, until the 19th century, science and technology were separated. But 20th century, we are going to witness a new situation in which science and technology were uh, blended and applied science emerged and it was in you know august 2nd 1939 albert einstein wrote a letter to the then president of united states of america franklin d roosevelt and the result was the manhattan project 43000 scientists were employed with a hoping expense of 2.2 billion US dollar. Since so December 1942, beneath a football stadium at the University of Chicago, under a football stadium at the University of University of Chicago, the Italian emigre scientist in USA, Enrico Fermi. created controlled nuclear chain reaction for the first time in human history. And in July 16, 1945, American physicist Robert Oppenheimer, he was a theoretical physicist, not a uh, practitioner, he was a theoretical physicist. That point is very important, friends. He was a theoretical physicist. And Robert Oppenheimer exploded world's first atomic a bomb at the trinity site in los angeles in new mexico and what happened is that on august 6 enola, en, en, enola gay dropped a uranium 235 bomb in hiroshima which killed seven seventy thousand people and august 9 a plutonium 239 bomb fell on Nagasaki, which even killed more than 70,000 people. And Japan surrendered in World War II. So the atomic bo bomb changed the entire scenario of the 20th century. Bomb launched the Cold War. And a military industrial complex emerged about which President Eisenhower uh, emotionally said that the world is going to be governed by a in military industrial complex. He emotionally said in a speech. So many other types of uh, bombs were dis invented. Uh, you know, hydrogen bomb, thermonuclear bomb. And friends, by the end of the 20th century, we are going to see that in medicine, technological revolutions took place. X-ray was discovered in 1895, CT scan and uh, you know, MRI and PET scan. All these developed with the commercial applications. And in 1928, British physician Alexander Fleming invented penicillin for which he got Nobel Prize in 1945. So penicillin was a wonder drug. And what happened is that in 1953, we know that DNA was, you know, uh, you know, 
analyzed by James Watson and Francis Crick in 1953. And in 1990, Human Genome Project started. And in, in 1998, a private company, Celeria Genomics, Celeria Genomics, headed by J. Craig Venter, entered into sequencing the entire human genome in three years. And they did it in 2001. They completed a first draft of the human genome. I still remember reading that news from Malayana Manorama uh, with the, uh, that uh, structure being you know, uh, shown in the friend cover of the Malayana Manorama. I still remember that news. So human genome was a big science project, 3 billion cost. And we know that cloning technology developed. In 1996, the sheep Dolly became the first cloned mammal. I still remember reading that news from Malayana Manorama newspaper. Cloning. A sheep named Dolly was cloned, was a cloned sheep. And friends, we know that still, there is possibility of human cloning, still the possibility of human cloning in a laboratory atmosphere, but the ethics of doing human clone is still disputed and we don't know whether any scientific labs in the world created a human clone. We have no idea about that. Uh, the world is still you know, un, uh, unaware of that. Maybe some scientific labs had uh, done some kind of human clones. We are not sure. Uh, but there are a lot of ethical issues involved in conducting human clones. And friends, along with these discoveries and inventions, we know that a computer revolution also took place. William Shockley, a mechanical engineer, created a solid transistor in 1947. Based on that, Charles Babbage conceived a universal calculating machine. And then the world had witnessed a computer revolution. In 1970s and 80s, PC was introduced, personal computer was introduced. And in 1977, we know at the college dropout, Steve Jobs brought to the American market the famous Apple II the Mac computer. In 1981, IBM branded their computer as PC. They used the operating system of Microsoft Corporation, which was owned by Bill Gates. And he was, a, like Steve Jobs, a university drop, dropout. And friends, the world has been ever since connected through internet and web, worldwide web. So a telecommunications revolution also took place along with the computer revolution. The first cell phone was invented by Motorola Dinatak in 1973. The first trials of cell system took place in Chicago in 1977 among 2000 customers. So cell phone revolution started in the 1980s and Japanese built the first commercial cellular telephone in 1979 itself. So friends, big science projects like Hubble telescope, International Space Station, Large Hadron Collider in Europe, these are all big science projects very uh, science projects one interesting thing we have to notice is that from the beginning of historic period abstract scientific knowledge and the practical application of science was two distinct branches we know Hellenic science never valued the practical application of knowledge. They have ridiculed any idea of application of scientific knowledge. 
into practical life. For them, knowledge remains for the sake of knowledge. We just know what it is and forget it. That's what their worldview, Hellenic worldview. So medieval Christians didn't allow for inquiry into the natural world. Christianity prohibited science. And societies based on taboos and beliefs never endorse the application of science. Many European countries in modern world we know were more hierarchical. So technique was not promoted in such society because they thought the upper class and the nobility in aristocrats in many European hierarchical society believed that technique will bring ease to the life of servants and lower classes. So scientific knowledge from since the antiquity was an orphan. Technology was an orphan right from the beginning of antiquity. It was developed independently. Our university degrees in a sense still carry the Hellenic value. It didn't endorse science for practical utility. Our university knowledge has to touch has, uh, has no touch with the practical needs of our civilizations or society. Universities have been disconnected with the needs of society. And we know there is huge be uh, gap between university knowledge and the demands of society at large. Our degrees have no touch with the realities of our world. So now the question is whether we need to enter into space missions and other big science projects. This question is relevant because do we really benefit whether big sciences will bring or improve the living conditions of people on the planet? It's an interviewing question friends, we don't have answer. Uh, of course, big sciences have philosophical and scientific value and its scientific and philosophical values are immeasurable. But we are uncertain whether big sciences will bring in any socially useful goods to societies and man. And friends, with this, this lecture is ended and now the floor is open for discussion.